Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 10th Brown Bag Summer Series using the biopsychosocial model to promote equitable care at UR Medicine. My name is Telva Oliveras, and I'm the Associate Chair of Diversity, Inclusion, Culture, and Equity for the Department of Psychiatry. And I will be your host today and next week. Today's presentation and all the remaining presentations in this series have been scheduled for an hour and a half. That is from noon to 1.30. At one o'clock, those of you who would like to continue discussion of the topic will be ushered into a break room to do so with our panelists. The ASL interpreters will also be available during the breakout sessions. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone that this is a webinar. We welcome and encourage all to put all your questions in the Q&A questions. These will be answered immediately after the presentation or if given time during at the end of the presentation. The chat feature will be disabled and used only by the panelists, except towards the end of the presentation when we will open it up and you will find a link there for your evaluations in order to receive CME credits. We are really excited to present this topic this year on the 75th anniversary of the Department of Psychiatry and to be sharing this platform with colleagues from the Department of Medicine, Wilmot Cancer Center, the School of Nursing, Neurology, Pediatrics, and the Office for Patient Experience. Health is a result of many factors. The biological processes of our bodies, our emotional states, and the social context in which we live. Rochester is the birthplace of the biopsychosocial model, a model that considers how all these factors interact to influence health and illness. In honor of our department's 75th anniversary, we invite you to join in our celebration by honoring the work of one of our department's great change agent, Dr. George Engel. As you will see, Dr. Engel wrote his biopsychosocial model really thinking about the patient-doctor relation. The UR medicine groups that you have listened to during this series have expanded on that knowledge and really uh, delivered biopsychosocial care to communities of uh, patients that are vulnerable and in need of this type of comprehensive care. The Department of Pediatrics will be doing today's presentation. Let me begin by introducing to you Dr. Greenberg. Dr. Greenberg is an adolescent medicine physician who specializes in adolescent reproductive health and directs the Galazano Children Hospital Program serving transgender and gender diverse youth. Her leadership roles include vice chair for equity and inclusion in the Department of Pediatrics and associate dean for equity and inclusion in the School of Medicine and Dentistry. Dr. Greenberg's area of investigation include adolescent sexual and reproductive health, supporting transgender and gender diverse youth, and inclusive excellence in academic medicine. Dr. Jamie Mer let me also introduce to you our second presenter, Dr. Jamie Merringer. Dr. Merringer is an adolescent medicine physician who specializes in gender affirming care for transgender and gender diverse youth. Serving youth from marginalized communities, sexual reproductive health and justice, eliminating health inequities. His, his research in gender affirming care has been published in Pediatrics, the Journal of Adolescent Medicine, and featured in multiple national meetings, including the Pediatric Academ Academic Societies. He joined the Division of Adolescent Medicine in 2020 after completing his fellowship at the Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania, residency at the University of Vermont and medical school at Case Western. Please help me welcome both of these great speakers. Thank you so much to Telva, Dr. Oliveras and the Department of Psychiatry for inviting us to present today. Um, if we can share our screen now, we will go ahead and get going. 
So as, as mentioned, we're going to talk about the biopsychosocial model in the context of our care for transgender youth, young adults, uh, their families, communities, and um, yeah. Uh, neither Jamie nor myself have financial disclosures. Uh, we are going to be discussing some off-label medications. A lot of what we do in pediatrics is off-label, um, but they're in line with best practices. And I, as always, I think we want to display gratitude to our patients and their parents and families, um, to our colleagues and collaborators and co-conspirators in the spaces of equity and um, health. One of the most important things to say about um, care for any young person is the recognition that young people exist within context. Um, young people exist in a relatively complex developmental stage of life. Um, we're looking at any adolescent who comes to us for any reason in terms of where they are in a biopsychosocial context. Where are they in physical, cognitive, or emotional development? What's their social circumstance? Where are they as far as health and wellness in their um, psychological wellness? Where are they in the context of family, school, community, all of those levels on which the biopsychosocial model teaches us to care for people? That happens for any youth. And my goal for any youth that I see for any reason, as I always tell parents, I'm a long game thinker. I say this to patients too. We're going to make some important decisions in the next couple months to a year. You know, there's going to be some choices that are important that we're going to sort of navigate together. But I'm really thinking about you in five or 10 years, right? I want you to be crushing it at adulting 10 years from now, whatever that means to you. And the decisions that we make along the way are really going to be in service of that goal. What are the things that we're going to decide together as a unit, as a patient and family centered care team that are going to get you to that place? And that's no different for trans youth who may be navigating some additional um, complexities, who may be depending on their psychosocial milieu, navigating some spaces of rejection, discrimination. Certainly we know that um, the transgender diverse LGBTQ uh, community writ large can be facing health inequities. Um, and so what do we talk about? We talk about building a safe nest. So we really take a young person um, from the core of their existence, which is that adolescents exist within families um, and talk about how do we start there? How do we make sure that you are nested at home within a safe context where you can be your true self and grow into being your best self, your most affirmed self, who you're meant to be? starting with family, school is another important piece, right? How do we sort of build that nest out? Um, and this is where I also say to people, you know, I graduated from the University of Rochester. I realized I should have put that in my intro. Um, I came here to learn, attracted by the biopsychosocial model. You all taught me the biopsychosocial model. And now I don't know how to be a doctor any other way. So thinking about these biopsychosocial constructs. That's how I approach every patient I see. Um, and thinking about the existence of a person within this spectrum. I'm gonna think about patients who I see who are transgender and who are seeking hormone care, not only at the level of how the hormones are gonna affect their tissues, tissue response to hormone and their organs, but also how the changes that may come from those hormones gonna affect how people perceive them um, and how they navigate the world and what that means as far as um, gender at attribution by others and their impact on safety, if that's a thing, right? And so I, I came here for the model, stayed for the model, and now this is just the way that I engage with folks. And so I was thrilled to see that we're celebrating the biopsychosocial model and really thrilled to think about how the work that we do in adolescent medicine with trans youth uh, can be, a, I think, a perfect example of, of biopsychosocial healthcare. This is the roadmap for today. I'm gonna to start with some shared definitions. I suspect a lot of these definitions are familiar to folks, but I think it's really important to have shared vocabulary as we get going to make sure we're all on the same page. 
Um, this is the gender unicorn um, and representing some contact, some constructs that I think it's important to disentangle. So the rainbow thought bubble representing gender identity, someone's internal innate sense of being male, female, both, neither, some other gender. The green dots over the unicorn's body representing how folks express their gender, which is socially constructed, um, hairstyle, clothing, mannerism, those are all external expressions of gender. Both of those potentially being different from sex, which is typically an assignment made at birth based on external genitalia, sometimes taking into account chromosomes, reproductive organs, hormones, um, and all of those very different from sexual orientation, someone's sexual identity in relation to people that they may be attracted to. And while the gender unicorn provides those definitions, it also provides an opportunity to um, relate these concepts to each other. And when we think about folks who fall under this really broad term, self-defined term of transgender, it's an umbrella term for folks whose gender identity doesn't align with the sex assigned at birth. So someone who's, um, when I explain this in very concrete ways to younger children, someone whose body parts that another person interpreted at birth to be boy, girl, some other, gen some other sex, don't align with their brains, with the ways in which they determine their gender and their way of being in the world. Lots of identities fall under the transgender umbrella more broadly, including what you'll see at the bottom, non-binary folks whose gender identity is neither male nor female or both male and female or some fluid construct of the two. So within the transgender community, there are lots of identities, some of which don't fall into that traditional boxes of male and female. Non-binary is a broad term for that. And then someone who's cisgender um, is generally meant some, to be someone whose sex and gender identity do align. Um, so in essence, the state of being not transgender is the state of being cisgender. So very broad terms, wanting to be sure that we're using the same language as we get on board. And while the gender unicorn is a mythical creature, uh, transgender people are not mythical creatures. They're actually incredibly common in everyday life. Um, we're gonna have lots of pictures throughout this presentation, which was put together by Jamie, my wonderful colleague, um, and I'm grateful that he's sharing it with everybody here today. Um, trans and gender diverse youth are really, really common. This nearly 2% figure is coming from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, or YRBS, which is a survey out of the Centers for Disease Control. Um, that may sound really different to some folks from numbers that you were taught. It's different from numbers that I was taught in medical school, which to the students on board today may sound, seem like a long time ago, but wasn't all that long ago. Um, we used to say that trans people, um, the numbers were like one in 10,000, that the numbers of trans women were incredibly higher than the numbers of people who are trans men or trans masculine identified. Why? We weren't really counting in any meaningful way. Uh, we were using Medicare claims data and all kinds of flawed circumstances to try and capture any numbers. Um, even the YRBS data that we have here is pretty selective because it's only from the state or locally administered YRBS surveys that happen to ask about gender identity. And so we don't have a great way of counting or a great way of determining these numbers. Um, and while there's lots of political motivations or other reasons for people to um, report that the numbers of trans people are really exploding, like it's some sort of, you know, contagious phenomenon. The answer is really that trans people have existed throughout human history and that the numbers that we have, um, we can't compare apples to apples. We can't track over time um, because we simply haven't been collecting data in a meaningful way. Um, hopefully we're correcting that now and these YRBS data will continue to be a stable point um, at least for those of us in youth serving worlds. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Merinder now. Thank you, Kate. 
So why is this topic so important? And why does this all matter? And a question that I'm commonly asked is why can't the kids just tough it out until they're older? Why do we need to do anything to affirm gender in young people? And well, for starters, it's just plain it's the right thing to do. So everyone deserves the right to live their life and their affirmed gender. So you deserve that right, I deserve that right, and they deserve that right too. And we also have to acknowledge the fact that this is a really high risk population. So we know that trans youth have higher rates of a whole host of negative health outcomes. And the research has repeatedly shown that about 30 to 50% of trans youth have attempted suicide. But why is that? It's not that there's something inherently dangerous about being trans, but rather it's the result of structural stigma, marginalization, victimization, and a lack of access to gender affirming care, which essentially means that it is the result of minority stress. So we also know that folks who have multiple marginalized identities, like trans people of color, are shouldering a double load and are facing even worse health outcomes. And yet in the face of these very well-known statistics, in the face of these known risks, trans youth are now being used as pawns in this really cruel game by politicians. So in the past few years, there's been this sudden obsession with trans youth by political figures who are um, aiming to really systemic, systematically strip away access to medical care, the ability to play sports, the ability to have a safe place to pee, the ability to be called by the correct name in school, even though we know that these efforts put kids in greater danger. And so here we see bills introduced just within the last legislative session alone that were seeking to ban gender affirming health care for youth or bills that were seeking to ban trans youth from playing sports. The shaded areas are where bills have been introduced and the darker the red, the more bills that were introduced in the last session. And I'm assuming at least some of these things have made it onto your radar and onto your news feeds. So here we've got just a couple of headlines from the past few months. So just this spring, Alabama signed into law a ban on gender affirming care for youth, which would make it a felony to provide gender affirming care punishable by up to 10 years in prison, even though this care is following the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations. It's just chilling. And they're going after adults too. So just last week, Florida passed a ruling that as of August 21st, next week, they will be barring Medicaid from covering any gender affirming services whatsoever, regardless of age. And I think one of the most disheartening things is that most of this legislation and most of these efforts are being led by people who don't even know trans folks or to put it more accurately, who don't know that they know trans folks. Because these are real lives that are being messed with, and these are real kids and real adults who are being systematically stripped of their rights. And so, like Kate said, we filled this presentation with images of trans youth, so you can see some of the lives that are at stake here. The good news, though, is that we can still do something about this. We know that family support and acceptance, that using the correct name and pronouns, that gender affirming medical care, and that policies and legislation that protect from discrimination and mistreatment, and ongoing advocacy to push back against the discriminatory legislation, we have data to show that all of this leads to better outcomes for trans individuals. And really it goes without saying that voting is also essential. So please show up. Please make those calls too. So these steps for things that we can do to help combat the health disparities are all an approach to care for trans folks that we call the gender affirming model of care. So let's talk more about this approach. So in 2018, the AAP published its policy statement on ensuring comprehensive care and support for trans youth. 
And some basic tenets of this gender affirming model include that trans identities are not mental disorders. In fact, variation in gender identity and expression is normal. Gender identity is something that evolves from a complex interplay of biology, development, socialization, culture. And core to this model is a developmental approach that values and supports kids for who they are, even at a young age, because the research shows that this fosters secure attachment and resilience. And this model of care is best facilitated through collaboration between a child's family, medical providers, behavioral health, taking a multidisciplinary approach. And it is not a one-size-fits-all approach. It is really tailored to the individual young person. So historically, the medical field had taken this watchful waiting approach to trans youth, where kids were told that their identities might be true, but nothing was done to support them until they reached a particular arbitrary age, whether it was into puberty or beyond. But we've really phased that out because it gaslit young people and it deliberately withheld critical support from them. We also have a growing body of evidence that it led to worse outcomes. So it's been replaced by the concept of affirmation. And with this, developmentally appropriate steps are taken to help the young person be their authentic self and live their life in their identified gender. So the gender affirming care model is truly an embodiment of the biopsychosocial model. So within it, there's four domains of affirmations, social, medical, legal, and surgical. And again, everything is tailored to the individual kid and their developmental stage. So depending on where they're at, not every domain is gonna be relevant. So let's walk through these different domains of affirmation, starting with the social. So social affirmation, or what sometimes people might refer to as, quote, social transition, is oftentimes the first step in gender affirmation for a young person. And that can include things like changing your clothing or hairstyle to reflect your gender identity, going by a different set of pronouns or a different name, using the bathroom that aligns with your gender. It could include working with a voice coach. It could also include binding or wearing chest compression garments to flatten the chest or wearing shapewear or prostheses to create a physical appearance that's more in line with how they identify. And for some folks, that might be all that's needed, depending on their age, their developmental stage, um, or their dysphoria. Like for four-year-old Jacob here, he doesn't need medicine. He doesn't need surgery. Right now, this is all that he needs. And with social affirmation, there's no side effects. It's 100% reversible. And the evidence shows that social affirmation can lead to a huge reduction in psychological distress and symptoms. And now, even though I said that social affirmation is often a first step in gender affirmation, this isn't always the case. So it's not uncommon, especially for me to have older patients who opt to start taking steps in their medical affirmation, like starting on hormones, before they socially transition. And oftentimes that's driven by concerns for their safety or fear of discrimination or losing their job. For example, I had a trans female patient who had very thick body hair and facial hair and a baritone voice, and she lived in a really conservative area. And for her, she opted to start pursuing hormones, hair removal, and doing some voice training for about a year before she started using a different name, pronouns, clothing, out of fear for her safety. Um, historically, people used to be prohibited from receiving any gender-affirming medical interventions until they had had what was deemed to be fully socially transitioned for some arbitrary amount of time, like 12 months. But thankfully, we have phased that out because it just isn't safe or beneficial for many people. So the next domain of affirmation is legal affirmation, and that can include steps taken to change one's name or legal gender marker, and that could be on a birth certificate, driver's license, or on the passport. 
a pretty new thing that we've started seeing is that several states have um, passed rulings to allow people to choose to have their gender marker listed as X or non-binary rather than just male or female. And as of April of this year, this non-binary gender marker is now an option on US passports as well. So let's transition to talking about some of the um, medical options. I'm gonna hand it over to Kate. All right, thank you. Um, medical affirmation is often one of the pieces that brings folks into our office, um, although there's no wrong way to come see us. And we see folks at many different stages along the way. And in biopsychosocial care, attend to all of the pieces that Jamie just spoke to as well. Medical affirmation, um, I cannot emphasize this enough. I think it's a piece that's often lost in the political conversation around this, which is why medical decisions belong between patients, families, and care providers and not in political discourse. Um, is the most individual patient and family-centered care I can imagine providing. There's a whole host of options and we're gonna go through these one at a time, but it really depends on age and developmental stage on that person's embodiment goals. Um, I would say particularly in talking to non-binary individuals, embodiment goals are huge. What is this person hoping to achieve? What's our role as medical providers in facilitating an affirming embodiment goal with the use of hormonal care? Um, what are the sources of dysphoria? What are the things that we're looking to do um, even as we're working on the process of hormone readiness to sort of bring down the temperature and help folks feel well. Um, and what are we doing for family support, for psychosocial support to assess all of these other areas of wellness that are connected to medical affirmation, um, but that have a whole separate set of needs. Um, again, and we're going to make some decisions around hormones in the next couple months or years, uh, but we're going to think about the the long arc of your life and, and what other types of support might be helpful. Um, puberty blockers are um, most traditionally used at the very beginning stages of puberty. And the picture that's in the lower right-hand corner is a, a fairly famous young woman um, named Nicole, uh, who here is next to her identical male twin. Um, and you can see that she had access to puberty blockers at the beginning of puberty. So for folks in the audience who are not pediatric trained, um, puberty goes through five stages with one being completely little kid body and five being completely grown up body. So two is when puberty just starts to turn on. And when puberty blockers are available to folks at um, sexual maturity rating or Tanner stage two, they really prevent the development of unwanted and very dysphoria inducing secondary sexual characteristics. So looking at Nicole compared to her brother, um, you can really see what his body with its own hormone production has started to produce as far as hair on the upper lip, a very prominent um, Adam's apple, vocal cartilage, really prominent cheekbones and um, uh, jaw widening, wider shoulders, um, you can appreciate how those changes would be affecting his twin psychologically and Nicole if she were undergoing those same changes um, and how problematic that would be for her. Not only do puberty blockers when used um, in patient-centered ways uh, decrease the need for future medical interventions because those effects of puberty that Nicole's brother are going through are not inter are are irreversible. His puberty is, is going, um, but it improves mental health outcomes. Blockers are 100% reversible. We've been using them for decades and decades in young people where puberty turns on way too soon, a condition called central precocious puberty, where puberty turns on when you're three or five. So we know that when you stop giving these medications, puberty proceeds as it would have. Um, and what it really does is allow time for kids to explore and make decisions for caregivers to process, get educated. And it takes the level of distress from an 11 
way, way, way down because when puberty starts to turn on and a young person who's experiencing gender dysphoria before puberty, if it goes way up, then we have to take it back down because young people who are experiencing these changes for whom it's provoking significant distress have a hard time doing any of this. And I, I think folks can appreciate the psychological distress that this can precipitate. On the other hand, and this is again where the, where the individual needs are paramount in the decision-making process. I think Jamie and I have both had young people who came out in a prepubertal way, got social affirmation, had conversations with their parents that were really important. And then when pubertal changes start, may or may not have the same embodied distress that another child might. And so if a young person identifies in a non-binary or cross-gender way, um, and then gets to puberty and they're like, Meh, this isn't so bad. We're like, okay, we have different conversations. It's not the end of the conversation. But if you aren't having embodied distress, then you don't need medications. And that's really, there's so many decision points at which the patient and their family are at the center of the conversation. Um, we do time limit their use a bit to protect bone health. That's a getting a little bit into the weeds. But the one thing that we watch more particularly is bone health. Another form of medical affirmation, this one we use very regularly in transmasculine folks or people assigned female at birth um, in the trans umbrella um, or the use of hormonal contraceptives to reduce or suppress menstrual bleeding because um, that can be a source of dysphoria for folks. Um, we use any of the available uh, hormonal contraceptive methods that have uh, bleeding suppression as a side effect, very commonly progesterone only methods, because sometimes folks want to avoid estrogen, but really anything is appropriate. Um, and with the traditional counseling and, um, you know, contraception or hormonal management that many different providers do. And for folks for whom dysphoria really comes along with menstrual bleeding, uh, again, suppressing menstrual bleeding alone can take levels of distress down significantly and allow people that mental space to think, process, make decisions when they're not being really um, distracted or having a lot of their energy taken away by the dysphoria that comes along with periods. We use testosterone blockers, spironolactone and bicalglutamide are two of the examples that block the androgen receptor. So they don't lower overall testosterone production in folks for whom that's a priority, but they really slow or blunt the changes that we see from testosterone. Those effects are, again, are mostly reversible. I should say, going back a slide, that hormonal contraception is 100% reversible. Um, the androgen blockers are um, mostly reversible and are another option that we have in the toolbox um, as a supplement to other therapies, as a standalone therapy for folks with non-binary embodiment goals, um, as a reversible intervention, if that's what's called for. And then we have gender affirming hormones, um, which come in two flavors, estrogen, um, for sort of feminizing secondary sexual characteristics, testosterone for masculinizing secondary sexual characteristics. Um, we start to consider those in our practice, plus minus age 14. Again, it's very patient and family centered. You'll see guidelines that start at age 16. Many of those center on um, a protocol coming out of the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, the age of majority is 16, where ours is 18. Both are arbitrary numbers. And again, this is patient and family centered. This is biopsychosocial care. It really depends on patient and family needs. Um, but that's where we consider things about in our practice. Estrogen induces breast growth, softer skin, redistribution of body fat, um, lowered body and facial hair growth. I mean, it really, um, helps people like Jazz Jennings, who you can see here, um, experience the world with a sense of them of a feminine body being affirmed by others as with a feminine appearance. Um, testosterone, and you can see this picture of Christian here, um, deepens the voice, increases facial and body hair, redistributes body fat in a more masculine body shape. 
markedly increases muscle mass, changes the genitals, suppresses menses over time. Um, both of these have fertility impacts. And so fertility preservation is something that we talk about prior to any hormone therapy um, with all patients all the time. All medications carry some risk. We'll talk about risk mitigation, I think, in the subsequent slide. Um, but we definitely talk about, um, as I say to people, estrogen makes your blood a little more sticky. Um, and so the risk of blood clot goes up with anyone on estrogen, be that people on contraceptive pills, um, trans women on estrogen therapy. The highest risk of any of these is really when we go super physiologic. So we watch levels and make sure that we keep them within um, physiologic normative levels um, and or on synthetic estrogens. Another problematic piece of data over time is that people were prescribing hormones known to be, forms of estrogen known to be particularly thrombogenic and we don't do that anymore. Um, Risk of breast cancer goes up. We definitely uh, know that because if you develop breasts, you have a higher risk of having breast cancer, but it still seems to be much lower than for cis females. And we're really studying again with the non-synthetic non estrogens with maintaining physiologic levels. Does this actually increase risk of heart disease or prolactinoma? Uh, testosterone, I definitely uh, treat a fair amount of acne. I say, welcome to being a teenage boy, like here we are. Um, we are having emerging evidence around lipids, blood pressure, heart disease risk. Again, we really avoid those super physiologic levels. We prescribe the lowest dose that makes people feel good with where they are with masculinizing and maintains them within a therapeutic range. Um, we watch red blood cells because polycythemia is a risk. And we talk about fertility, uh, the fertility outcomes of, of, um, either sort of flavor of hormone care, estrogen or testosterone are not as well studied as they should be. And so we work closely within our system with uh, fertility experts. And we definitely uh, discuss this with patients and families as a part of the informed consent process. Again, always discussed. Fertility preservation is a really important thing um, for us to cover. I would say it is, I think, not as important potentially to um, patients and families. And one of the things that I emphasize, or to patients, one of the things that I emphasize when I talk to patients and families is the ways in which LGBTQ folk have been creating family um, throughout human history, and that there's lots of ways to make family. Um, when folks are particularly interested in fertility preservation, one of the major barriers is that it's rarely covered by insurance. Um, the process itself can be really dysphoria inducing for people. Um, and for our youngest patients, it has to be done in later pubertal stages. And so given the 2022 technology, this is a barrier because we have folks who are just like Nicole in that earlier slide afforded the opportunity to have um, puberty blockade, but aren't yet mature enough to have puberty, um, to have fertility preservation. We weigh the risks and the benefits and we weigh really the risks of hormone therapy against the risks of withholding therapy from a person who needs it. And certainly in discussion with patients and families, we very frequently find that the risks of withholding are much greater than the theoretical risks that underlie hormone therapy. We use an informed consent model that's fairly extensive. We really do um, go over all those risks and the benefits with, with folks, talk about fertility preservation, use our lab monitoring, the lowest effective dose, talk about healthy lifestyles. And we involve a behavioral health provider in collaboration um, for folks under the age of 18. So we have a fully informed consent model for most patients who are of adult age. But with folks who are under the age of 18, we really do rely on collaborative partnership with behavioral health. When we talk about the role of the AAP, um, carves out for behavioral health. Um, sorry, I'm gonna switch now to talking about surgical affirmation, which is another thing laid out when we talk about comprehensive care. Bottom line is some people require surgical affirmation to alleviate dysphoria and some do not. 
and pop culture is really focused on the surgery. So if you all take one thing home from the presentation today, please do not ask people about the surgery. If you are a medical provider who has a need to know, this is not the space where we give our whole spiel on that, but we have one, both Jamie and I and anyone else who provides gender affirming care on sort of um, how we ask about parts and surgical goals when that's medically appropriate. Um, but there are lots of potential surgical interventions that folks may request or may need to alleviate their dysphoria. And then there are many folks for whom no surgery is required. And that's again, a patient and family centered decision. Um, top surgery, uh, the creation of a male chest contour in someone whose body has developed breast tissue is definitely the most common thing that folks in our practice request. Um, and that's something that is happening at younger ages because it's really, really hard to uh, have a, an affirmed male gender and have a large and developed set of breasts. Um, and chest binding, which is an option, is often uncomfortable and has its own set of side effects that can, people can, can find pretty draining when done year after year after year. And some of Dr. Marringer's research has actually been on the um, profoundly dysphoria relieving effects of top surgery for younger folks. And then there are a number of um, genital and non-genital procedures that are generally deferred until the age of 18. This is where I, I skipped my surgery slide in my head before. What about the role of behavioral health? Where do we go with that? I tell people, all people, all patients, and many non-patients as well in my personal life, that I think therapy is like flossing. It's really good for us. It gets into the nooks and crannies of the brain. We should all do more therapy. Um, so patients that I see for lots of reasons, including gender health, I recommend having a couple of sessions with folks to figure things out. A gender transition can be a major event in people's lives, regardless of the age that they're coming to me at. And I think it can be important to have a place for problem solving and some feelings talks. Um, but as I said, in our um, practice, the only folks that we really, really strongly encourage that for are our folks transitioning under the age of 18. Um, high school and middle school are hard enough without adding a gender transition into it, depending on the area of uh, the state and the region that folks are coming from. And we serve really most of central and western New York. There are some other practices around, but we have a huge catchment area. You know, support of that nest is really huge. Family communication, acceptance, support systems, um, support with social affirmation in school, in faith communities, and larger communities, really understanding treatment effects. Um, I have had a couple of young people with just amazing levels of family and community support. But when it came time to move from blockers into hormones and really processing fertility, um, needed some extra time. Uh, one young person in particular was like, Dr. Greenberg, I've known all this since I was eight. I don't need this. And then when I said, no, nah, man, you got to go like talk through the informed consent for real. She had some significant feelings about the loss of fertility, even though it was the right thing to do and took some time to process it and sort of thanked me for making her go to therapy. Um, so it happens sometimes. Um, so we really do rely on that partnership. It's not a performative checkbox. You have to go get a letter. We really frame it in terms of let's figure out all of the ways in which behavioral health as a part of your transition can really help make this successful and think about the long game and what you and your family need. I will pass this back over to Jamie to bring us through. All right. So there we go. So, and I think it's so important in when we're thinking about behavioral health to make sure that the behavioral health is something that we're doing to add additional support for our patients and not to make this yet another hoop to jump through or um, yet another thing to serve as a barrier or make care even harder to obtain. So it's always about a balance. And I think it's becoming increasingly challenging for us to find behavioral health providers who have a clue about how to 
be an ally and how to support people who are going through this process, um, who accept insurance and who have the ability to see patients. So while it's in general ideal for patients to be able to have the behavioral health support, um, it's also a fine line to walk between not making that um, a barrier to care. And so we are in such need of more um, skilled behavioral health providers, which we're lucky to have a number of excellent colleagues here at Strong Behavioral Health. Unfortunately, the waiting list is so long. So let's talk about what you can do in practice to support trans folks. So one of the most important things that you can do is to use people's name and pronouns. So let's start with a case. So JL is a 15-year-old who's coming in to see you in primary care clinic for the first time as a new patient to your practice. And their medical record lists their name as Jose and their sex is male. So when is the right time to ask about JL's name and pronouns? Well, I like to ask right up front when I'm introducing myself. I like to give my pronouns when I'm introducing myself to a patient and I have a pronoun badge that I wear and it normalizes it and it sends a signal that this stuff matters to me. And you can- Jamie, excuse me, Jamie, yeah. there's a black box over your slide. Could you close the uh, question and answer block box? Ah, oh, thank you. Thank Is that you. better? <laughs> Sorry yeah. about that. Um, and you can put this on intake forms too. So how do you ask about someone's name and pronouns? That's a question that I get a lot. And my answer is really don't overthink it. I usually just say, what name do you go by? What are your pronouns? So JL shares that she's recently started going by the name Julia and uses she, her pronouns. Now, what do we do? This is a great time to say thanks for sharing, because for some folks, disclosing this information can be really intimidating. So this simple response sends the message that you hear them and you value this information. And this is also a good time to find out how they want you to use that information. You want to be sure to get their permission before you start putting this all over their chart or saying it in front of family members, because for some people, they might not be out to anybody else yet. And unfortunately, there's some kids who could be at risk of being abused or kicked out of the home if they were to be outed to an unsupportive family member. So it's a great time to just check in. And is it okay for me to use your name or pronouns around your family? Is it okay for me to use that name or pronouns in your chart? So Julia shares that she's out to her family and she says, yep, it's totally fine to use her name and pronouns in the chart and around her folks. So how big of a deal is it to get someone's pronouns right? It's a really big deal. So the research shows that calling a youth by their affirmed name and by the correct pronouns is the number one indicator to them that an adult supports and accepts them. The research also shows that folks who are consistently referred to by the right name and pronouns have lower rates of depression, lower rates of suicidal ideation, and lower rates of suicide attempt. So if a person tells us how they want to be called, it is our duty to make an effort to get it right. It's not enough to say like, oh, they, them pronouns are hard for me, so I'm gonna use like he instead, like not, not, not okay. So it's our duty to make an effort and get it right. So when Julia's mother joins us towards the end of the visit, you accidentally slip up and you refer to Julia as he. Oh no, oh no, like what do you do? Inevitably, at some point, this happens to all of us. We're gonna slip up. And when it does, you should apologize, correct yourself, and move on. So you can say, I'm sorry, I meant she, and then keep moving. So this last piece, moving on, is important. You don't wanna be like, oh, I'm G, I'm so sorry, I can't believe I said that, I'm not like that, I accept you, I'm not transphobic, I swear I have a gay sibling. Like, 
Because if you overreact, if you make a huge deal and a show out of it, not only have you hurt the person by misgendering them, but now you're essentially putting them in the position of needing to care for you and your discomfort. It puts them in the position of having to tell you, oh, it's okay. And it's not fair to put people in that position. So apologize, correct yourself, and move on. And now something really important to keep in mind, especially these days, now that we're in the era of open notes, is that it's not enough to just get names and pronouns right in our face-to-face -face interactions. So what we document is just as important as what we say in the exam room. So that brings us to action item number two, which is to use affirming documentation. So I just finished up a study with my colleague, Ash Alpert, and some other collaborators. And we did a series of focus groups with trans adults, um, asking them about their experiences using electronic health portals like MyChart and seeing their medical records. And I want to share with you some of our findings. So we found that when individuals read notes that are not written in affirming language, that this can be hugely invalidating. It undermines trust, not only in the provider who wrote the note, but also it can undermine trust in the entire care team and the institution as a whole. It can also lead people to withhold disclosing sensitive information, even information that's actually medically relevant, because folks are afraid that they're going to be disrespected, invalidated, or get inferior care. And it can lead some folks to choose to seek their care elsewhere or even avoid getting care altogether. So documentation is a potential landmine, and we really can't afford to get it wrong. But there's also a lot of potential for good when we get things right. So when folks read notes that were written using affirming language, we're seeing that this can make people feel supported, valued, and respected. It builds confidence in the provider who wrote the note and also in the rest of the care team and the institution as a whole. And it also helps folks feel safe about disclosing sensitive information. So let's talk about what it means to be affirming in the documentation. So the number one most important thing is to get the pronouns right. It is not enough to gender the patient correctly when you're talking to them. You also need to do that in writing too. And just as important is to refer to the person by the name that they want to be called. So we're hearing that many providers will write the name and pronouns at the top of the note, but then proceed to like use the wrong name or pronouns throughout the rest of the note. And participants told us that this really feels like a slap in the face. So please don't do that. Use the correct name and pronouns throughout the whole note. Please don't put quotes around somebody's name or pronouns because that implies that they aren't real. Many providers at some point have been told that they should refer to someone's name or their pronouns as, quote, preferred. And we recommend, and our participants recommended, that you just say pronouns or, if absolutely necessary, affirmed name or pronouns. One of our focus group participants said, you know, I prefer my coffee with cream, but my pronouns just are she and her. There's no need to mention the assigned sex at birth unless this is truly clinically relevant to the current situation. Otherwise, feel free to leave it out. It certainly doesn't need to be noted multiple times in the same note. And if there's no way to avoid the use of diagnostic terms or pathologizing language, it's important to talk about that in advance. So for example, I have a conversation with patients in advance. I say, you know, I want you to know that a label like gender dysphoria is probably going to show up in your note. And it's not how I think about you really. The only reason that it's there is so that in your insurance is going to pay for you to get the medical care that you need so that they're going to cover your hormones. And I also invite them to always let me know if there's anything that they're reading in their notes that doesn't feel good so that we can figure out how to do a better job. So let's practice. So here's an excerpt of some documentation that we've seen. So Jessica, quote, Josh, is a 20-year-old female who wants to be a male presenting to clinic for right ankle pain. 
Well, he reports that the pain has been going on for three weeks. So how might you rewrite that to be more affirming? Well, one option might be Josh is a 20-year-old presenting to clinic for right ankle pain. He reports the pain's been going on for three weeks. So taking the he out of quotes, just using the affirmed name. Um, and if it's not really clinically relevant, especially if it's documented elsewhere, do we really need to specify sex assigned at birth? So action item number three, so something that you can do in e-record to help with getting names and pronouns right is to update the SOGI form when it's appropriate. So SOGI stands for Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity. So let's go over to e-record so that I can show you what I'm talking about. So let's say that we're taking care of this patient whose legal name is Peter ZZ Parker and whose legal sex is male and who's 23 years old. And we're pulling up a note and the note template is automatically pulling in their name, their gender marker and pronouns. But let's say that Peter doesn't actually go by the name Peter or identify as male. What do we do? Well, if we go over to the sidebar here and we click on the gender marker right here, that's gonna open up the SOGI form, the Sexual Orientation Gender Identity Smart Form. And in here, we can, with the patient's permission, update their preferred or affirmed name. And let's say that Peter goes by the name Paula and that Peter's pronouns are she, her, and sex assigned at birth was male, but let's say that Peter identifies as non-binary. Well, if we close this, we can see over here in the sidebar, we now have Peter has been replaced by Paul, Paula, and the legal name still exists, but this is the name that's highlighted as Paula. The gender marker is now updated to read non-binary and the pronouns are highlighted underneath. And if we go back over to our note and refresh, we can see that we're now pulling in the patient's affirmed name, their gender identity and pronouns. So it's super important to know that whatever you put into that uh, quote unquote preferred name box or the pronouns or gender identity is going to be visible by anybody who opens up the patient's chart. It's going to be visible on my chart, which includes proxies of every level. Um, and it'll be used on most snail mail that's sent to the patient, used by robocalls to the home. So having all of these things updated can be incredibly helpful and appreciated and affirming but it's also important that to know that it has the potential to put somebody into an uncomfortable or unsafe situation if they're not out yet, especially if they're not out to family or caregivers. So it's really important that you talk with your patient before you update those things, just to make sure that they're fine with it, that they're fine with all of these things being changed over. Um, we get asked a lot about like, what about insurance? Is this going to screw up insurance and billing and prescriptions and medical legally? The answer is that it's not going to mess with any of this. So e-record still holds on to the legal name and keeps that separate. Um, and it's going to bill insurance and put that legal name on prescriptions. Um, but it's going to not display that name uh, on everything in e-record. So you are not going to break the system. And so I think I'm out of time. We are out of time. I think we could go on for a whole other hour, uh, Jamie. That was really informative. And I can't begin to tell you how many of us practice in another system. And this is a, just a, a helpful way to really uh, understand 
um, the importance of uh, using, being an ally, uh, learning all the time how we can be more supportive and affirming with our patients. And you and Kate have done an outstanding job today. So thank you very, very much. I want to invite everybody that wants to ask questions to stay with us in the break room. It can be uh, a few minutes, you ask your question or we can, uh, or you can stay a little bit longer and have discussion, whatever uh, suits you. In the chat box right now, you're gonna find two links. One is for the evaluation and your CME, and the other one is to go to the break room. We'll see you next Wednesday, it's presentation by the Office of Patient Experience that it's titled The Future of the Biopsychosocial Equitable Care, The Patient's Perspective. And it's going to be presented by Jackie Beckerman and Jenny Argentieri. So can't wait to see you next week. Everybody, please join us in the break room. <laughs>